So good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for, for joining us uh, this Wednesday lunchtime and for taking some time out of your day to join us for the second uh, uh, lunchtime lecture in our series uh, hosted by Trinity College Dublin. Uh, my name is John Gallagher. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Engineering uh, in Trinity and uh, I'm kind of the, the MC for, for these sessions, happily to facilitate questions to our expert speakers throughout the series and um, if you want to know more about uh, about the series, um, please do get in touch. Um, so to today, this is a kind of a, a climate action sustainability. For some of you who are joining every week, I just have kind of two slides, two or three slides to remind you what's going on. Uh, the first is, as I said, this is the second, um, uh, uh, second of part one. And we have up to 12 webinars we're going to run over the coming months. Uh, with leading academics across the university, with our first few speakers coming from, from the School of Engineering. But they're sharing their knowledge and perspectives uh, on addressing national and global challenges. And I thought in the national and global challenges, um, our speakers are, are, are addressing some of these, and, and Roger might have these two slides in his, in his deck to kind of contextualize his talk in a moment. Climate action plan, the national priorities that we're facing here in Ireland, um, the on an international face, because our work is not just uh, uh, focusing on on a, an inward view of Ireland, but also global challenges around sustainable development, um, and that's where uh, we frame our our, our work. It's, it's have a national context, but also have an international output. So it's my great pleasure uh, today uh, for session two um, to have a, a colleague from the department, um, Professor Roger West. He's a professor in structural engineering and the director of uh, Trinity House, if you haven't, are not familiar, which is our uh, university's research center in construction, innovation and sustainability, as well as being a fellow of the university. But his work over the many years is around innovations and in concrete technology. And that has led to him working uh, and publishing much of his work, working with industry and indeed uh, working internationally uh, across the different continents. Um, Roger teaches on, on a range of our programs, such as our MSc in engineering, uh, contributes some valuable uh, modules in, in, in this topic. And I suppose today, um, uh, I think Roger's uh, title is probably one of the catchiest I think we have in the series, uh, Cutting Concrete's Carbon. Uh, so it's my pleasure to hand over to Roger. I'm going to stop sharing just to, as I'm doing that, um, just to encourage you all, please, uh, do uh, add your questions into the chat or Q&A, uh, raise your hands and I'll come to you at the end of the session. We'll try and close up at about 10 to the hour to give you a few minutes before the next task that you have at hand. Um, but please do um, I encourage you all to answer questions. So Roger, if you want to share your screen, I'll hand over to you and thanks for joining us share the screen. today. just yet. Perfect. So Roger, um, uh, I can hear you. And okay. You can hear me okay? Perfectly. So over to you and we'll look yeah, forward thank to you. the questions at the end. John, thank you very much and thank you for the introduction. And uh, you're almost welcome uh, to this, the second in the series of, of these seminars. And uh, um, I'm, I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes and then uh, I'm particularly interested to see what questions my talk might give rise to. Um, so please do reserve your questions and I'll answer them if I can. So um, I'm going to talk today uh, about uh, something which is really a, a very significant global problem. Uh, and that is the uh, carbon which is associated with the use of, of concrete. And and my screen has frozen for a moment, just bear with me. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so as as John highlighted, uh, um, there, there, I should indicate which particular uh, areas of the enormous challenges that we have on climate action and climate change, and sustainability goals. Uh, um, I'm going to be principally talking about how to build better, uh, and. Uh, on the main goals themselves, I identified that what I'm going to talk about 
could probably fit into five of these in its most general form. Uh, and I, I hope by the time we get to the end, uh, you'd agree with that uh, assessment. So uh, we all know, of course, that uh, con concrete is ubiquitous in the true sense of the word. Um, concrete is all around it. It's used in every country in the world. Uh, and I've obviously given some good examples here of, of, of challenges and great beauty and uh, uh, functionality and utility uh, of concrete. And uh, um, there are, of course, two fundamental problems with concrete. One is we have the technical knowledge now, by and large, to make concrete sustainable and uh, durable. But how do we make it last for its lifespan? That's the first challenge, which I'm not going to talk about today, uh, because I think we understand it well enough to do that, but we need to get that message out. Uh, and then the second thing, of course, is how do we deal with the fact that, that concrete, uh, when you manufacture it and you place it, uh, is that it has a high carbon footprint. So that's what I'm going to be principally dealing uh, uh, with today. And just to look at some numbers, uh, um, there's an enormous amount of concrete uh, used worldwide. And uh, during the course of this presentation, I'm going to be using not too many numbers, but some numbers. And you know, I don't really want us to get into uh, the nuances of whether numbers are, are, are right or, or not. Uh, around about 10 billion cubic meters are used. Now, whether it's 10 million more or less than that, I'm not really interested in. Uh, uh, it's the fact that an enormous amount is being used. And uh, uh, if you look at the statistics from the cement industry, um, that means there's about, uh, uh, well, four and a half billion uh, uh, tons of cement is used annually. And uh, indeed, we shouldn't forget as well that uh, concrete normally uses potable water. Uh, approximately two trillion litres of water will be used in that 10 billion cubic metres. So we're using an enormous amount of, of, of materials. And if you understand, as indeed we do, that around about 8 billion people now is going to go to somewhere between 9.5 and, and 10 billion by 2050. Uh, uh, and e every country will want to develop its infrastructure. Um, uh, the growth of the use of concrete is only going to continue. And therefore, we really have to not only deal with today's problem, but we have to have the foresight to deal with the problems of tomorrow as well. Um, one thing I did in, in, in thinking about this is um, the Concrete Society is 50 years old this year, and myself with uh, 49 other colleagues, uh, we're putting together a small book, uh, which will be available free to everybody who wants it, uh, on the different types of concrete which are available. And in fact, we had to whittle it down from about 70 types of concrete to 50 types of concrete, so one per author. And uh, only two of those are directly related to this, and that is uh, zero carbon and low carbon concrete. But of course, many of the types of concrete that are spoken about uh, are there in order to, to address and deal with some of the carbon issues which I'm going to talk about. Um, so that's coming out in, in May if you, if you keep an eye out for it. And in this talk, um, I want to take a more holistic view. There's an enormous amount of work going on in research, in conferences, in workshops and seminars all over the world. I get invites almost every week. And uh, um, uh, they cover a very wide range of areas of sustainability. Um, some of the terms here, durability, affordability, the circular economy, recyclability, um, all of those things, yes. Uh, but the one I want to focus on today is low carbon. So when I started to think about how do we go about cutting uh, uh, the amount of carbon that's associated with the use of concrete in all its aspects throughout its life. Um, I sat down to think about it for a while on a train journey, actually. And I tend to, when I'm planning lectures, I tend to use mind maps. And this is what I ended up with. Uh, uh, all the things that might affect carbon in any shape or form. And as you can see, it's, it, there's a lot to it and it's quite complex. And there are people who are researching or people who are experts in many of the aspects here. So I can only touch the surface today to maybe indicate where we are and, and what the serious challenges still ahead of us are. And I hope maybe you will get something from that. So in essence, I'm going to take this collection of ideas and uh, uh, talk about cutting concrete's carbon. So let's get straight to the nub of the matter. The nub of the matter uh, essentially is, all other things being equal, is that um, there is a, a universal material which is used throughout the world, which is concrete, and it fundamentally works because of Portland cement. And Portland cement, as you all know, is the binder or the glue that combines together stone and sand. Uh, and the glue is formed by adding a powder, which is cement, to water to create concrete. And in the process of creating this, um, 
uh, there are two significant sources of carbon. The first one is uh, to bring the raw materials together, uh, which are excavated out of the earth, to bring those raw materials together uh, uh, and create uh, powdered cement. Uh, we need to bring the materials to a very high temperature, 1,415 degrees approximately in a kiln. And uh, by and large, many plants use hydrocarbons in order to do that. So that's our first problem. The second problem is naturally, as the materials fuse together, when you add uh, heat to limestone, which is one of the fundamental raw materials, calcium uh, carbonate, uh, a reaction occurs uh, that releases lime, oxide uh, or uh, calcium oxide, which is free lime, uh, and also releases a lot of carbon dioxide. So there's our two problems uh, uh, fundamentally as to why cement has such a strong influence on the high carbon footprint of concrete. If we were talking 20 years ago, uh, um, the, this plant here, which is uh, at the time when it was built, was one of the most modern plants in Europe, uh, uh, in, in uh, Platten. Um, it, before this was built, um, and, and indeed throughout Ireland uh, and in many places in the world, we had a, a rule of thumb, about a thousand kgs of CO2 per tonne of cement. And nowadays in Ireland, the average is give or take uh, 100 kgs, I suppose, uh, uh, down to around about 750 kgs. And that's principally because alternative fuels have been able to be used. And that obviously needs to be expanded still, but there's been great progress. And we should recognize that progress in trying to address this problem. Um, the process of what happens when you add water to cement is, is, is complex, chemically very complex, uh, but it can be summed up in this very simple equation, um, uh, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. But in essence, when you add water to cement, you create a glue, which is the CSH gel, and there's a byproduct, which is calcium hydroxide. And that's important because if you're using less cement or putting less cement in, you're going to have less carbon uh, hydroxide. And carbon hydroxide is important for giving concrete one of its properties, which is that it's an alkaline material. And because it's alkaline material, it helps to protect uh, steel, reinforcing bars uh, and indeed pre-stressing tendons in concrete. So if you reduce the cement content, there's a risk that you might reduce the protection of the steel and create a durability issue. So one of the minima that we have, or limiting criteria we have, is to use a minimum amount of cement. So uh, what about the solutions, pan panacea solutions to this? Uh, uh, well, on the left-hand side, uh, alternative fuels are well-established and developed and, and being expanded, and there's a cost associated with this. Uh, by and large, they're well-proven. They're, they're not without their challenges in relation to uh, uh, how to source it and how to, how to deal with the, uh, uh, what, the combustion of these materials. But the one that, uh, and that I imagine will progress over the next decade or so, and we will achieve much better performance in relation to that. The one that's most challenging, of course, is carbon capture. And, and that is that in the release of carbon dioxide, uh, many industries manage to have carbon capture. But uh, to get this to work within in the cement production and to store the carbon and perhaps even better still reuse it, still have significant challenges. And even when those challenges are met, um, the sheer cost of implementing that uh, could well make concrete a much more expensive material. Currently, it's, it's a very affordable material for almost every country in the world. It's one which cost is not a significant impediment to its use. So if it becomes very expensive due to the cost of installing carbon capture, then that's something which needs to be dealt with. But of course, there are many alternative cements which are being investigated and proposed in this little triangle on the left-hand side of the oxides uh, which com comprise the constituents of cement. If you see Portland cement, which is the fundamental cement we've used for very successfully for many years, is there many alternatives? And some of the primary ones are here, such as uh, slag, for example, GGBS, uh, uh, fly ash used very successfully in some countries, and, and then perhaps some of the more recent ones, such as metacalin. Uh, um, these are, are cements which are being investigated by uh, a large number of people in order to try and see whether or not uh, it, it can replace Portland cement because of its high uh, carbon footprint. In fact, within Europe, uh, very soon we'll have a, a new standard for cement, which will, I think, have a, a family of around about 35 different types of cement. We have the hydraulic ones, such as Portland cement, which 
get stronger on their own. We have latent hydraulic ones such as slag, which need a little bit of help to develop at a reasonably sense its strength at a reasonably sensible rate. And then we've got the pozzolanic materials such as fly ash and silica fume and the pozzolans, the natural pozzolans. Uh, um, and all of these uh, uh, require some help because they don't become cementitious on their own. So on the diagram on the right hand side, uh, one of the most common one successfully used in many countries is uh, pulverized fly ash. And uh, countries such as China and India and indeed the UK uh, uh, have been using um, the waste material from electricity generation. Of course, this involves coal and the combustion of coal. And that in itself is a sustainable uh, question which we, we have to ask and tackle. So you, if PFA is going to, as it's called, is going to be a, a long-term solution, um, we're, we're surely not going to go down a track of creating lots more in fact, we would want to use less uh, um, uh, um, electricity generating station which rely on, on coal. So the, although it's not plentiful, of course it's not, it's, in fact, it's not available in Ireland uh, uh, for structural use without importing it. So therefore, this is not a uh, significant con contribution to the long-term sustainability of concrete. But you do need um, the calcium hydroxide in order to get uh, to pozzolans to react. So I'll, I'll be referring to that later. Um, uh, the one that is used in Ireland uh, uh, more and more now, uh, very successfully used uh, for, for particular applications is uh, slag or ground granulated blast furnace slag. And we shouldn't forget that to create uh, uh, slag, you do need to get the waste product from the manufacture of steel. And steel, of course, itself is a very high carbon footprint, two to three times higher, uh, at least uh, compared to, to uh, cement. Um, so you, it doesn't come for free, but I think it's well recognized. That, uh, and again, I don't want to argue over numbers, but it's well recognized that slag is, is, is a low carbon uh, cement, uh, typically less than 100 kilograms uh, uh, of CO2 per ton. So while it's recognized as being low carbon, it has very particular properties. Um, not all the, the properties are advantageous. Um, it carbonates at a faster rate. Uh, and therefore, uh, if you don't plan for that uh, and uh, design for that, it is that you could be having a durability issue, which again would give rise to long-term repair and therefore carbon issues. Uh, and, and it is uh, imported, but used uh, very successfully in Ireland. It's not favored for precast. And pre precast, of course, is, a, is something which is receiving a lot of interest attention because of its efficiencies. And I'll say a little bit word about that, but um, it's not favored there because uh, of the productivity problems due to the slower rate of reaction uh, of GGBS. So the types of cements, again, we should recognize the progress that has already happened and exists. So um, our SEM1 or our traditional Portland cements have now been replaced, largely replaced by SEM2 ALs. And that uses less cement, less clinker, as I would say, uh, no less cement, but less clinker. Its composition is different uh, due to the use of limestone powder without any deleterious effect on the performance of, this, of, of the cement. And similarly, other manufacturers are using a pulverized fuel ash uh, uh, in, in the same way. And then we, of course, in Ireland, we can combine that together with slag up to 70%. And again, so if you're using uh, 50, 60, 70%, to GGBS, you're using that much less uh, clinker. So these uh, uh, are low, lower carbon, including the, the SEM2IL, are all lower, lower carbon cements, effectively. So we have gone some way, but uh, we've an awfully long way to go. Now, there are alternatives uh, which are, 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 have been used successfully in some countries and are being trialed, uh, and that's where you don't use any Portland cement at all, such as an alkali activated cement. So you have to artificially activate the cement because the lime is no longer available because you're not hydrating any Portland cement. So you have to artificially activate it to get it to harden and to strengthen at a reasonable pace. And there are other terms we need to be a little bit careful of. Uh, uh, certainly the word earth friendly concrete uh, uses a no Portland cement, but it doesn't insist on using recycled aggregate. And I think that's something that, that should be looked at. And eco concretes also suggest that many other types of waste could be put into concrete. But remember as engineers in the cements that have what is called specific suitability, which are the ones that I've listed up above, um, they all have uh, been acknowledged as meeting the stringent uh, strength and durability requirements which we have to have for our structures. So if you're putting any uh, material into concrete, don't be surprised if the poor performance goes down and, and you can use it perhaps for low grade applications, but you need, we need to be extremely careful we don't uh, tee up some very significant strength or durability issues. So these things have to be very carefully understood and controlled in the day-to-day -day production, and indeed they are uh, for the cements which I've mentioned. And there are other cements on the horizon which are still in the 
their infancy, uh, the use of crushed glass, recycled glass, for example, uh, uh, and indeed emerging are calcinated clays, but I won't say too much about them today. I do want to say a few words about aggregates. Um, uh, the aggregates uh, uh, have uh, uh, sustainability issues for sure, are matters that need to be dealt with, but the whole blasting and the transportation and the primary, secondary and tertiary crushing and the storage of these materials, it does use energy, of course, and therefore CO2 in one form or another, unless you electrify everything that, that's going to take place. And where certain countries in the world, uh, not yet Ireland, but uh, certain countries have actually run out of natural sand and they have to manufacture their sands which are an essential ingredient within concrete. So again, there are challenges associated with how do we create an artificial sand uh, from a waste material uh, uh, and using the minimum amount of energy, uh, particularly energy not associated with carbon. So to give you an idea as to uh, um, how the aggregates work is that they have uh, generally in Ireland, they're very good properties by and large in concrete, uh, structural concrete. And uh, you can see some of the quantities that we use there. So a lot of stone, a certain amount of sand and then a small amount of cement. But if you look at the image on the left hand side, you can see um, it's a pore filling exercise. We use as much stone as we can uh, uh, because it's affordable and it, it has good, good properties. And then uh, if you look at the diagram on the right hand side, you can see that the, uh, 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 you know, the voids is typically about 30% in aggregate. So the, the voids that exist between the stone have to be filled by the sand which is typically much smaller in size. And then the cement glues it all together, but it also has to fill up all the voids. So if you don't design the mixture of your stone, both in terms of its size and the quantity, grade it very well, you're going to have to have more, a lot more cement that's necessary. So one thing we tend not to focus on, I think we could do more on, and research shows this, is to optimize the aggregate content. So we, we tend to focus a lot on water cement ratio for strength reasons and durability reasons, but we really need to look at can we actually pack the concrete better so that we use the minimum amount of cement. So let the cement be the driver uh, uh, rather than something that, that uh, is going to deliver on the, some of the properties of the concrete. And to illustrate this point of some research we've been doing, the diagram on the left will indicate to you uh, uh, how if we use only stone or only sand, we don't end up with the, uh, the best void content. Remember that the, the, the smaller the quantity of voids, the less cement we have to uh, uh, use in order to fill up those voids. So if you look at the central graph, for example, uh, here, um, one of my postgraduates was looking at using different types of sand in different quantities in different fractions within, within a 20 millimeter aggregate in concrete uh, to see how best we can, we can optimize it. And as you see, you move from the green line to the, to the uh, orange line, uh, we're reducing the voids and therefore reducing the amount of cement. In other words, we're optimizing the aggregates. And on the right hand side, you can see that this does in the orange graph, you can see this does indeed deliver uh, better strengths. The better the packing, the better the strength. And if you don't need the extra strength, then maybe you could do with less cement. Yeah, so in other words, increase the aggregate cement ratio. Uh, you can still end up with the strength you wanted uh, and have the durability you wanted, provided you don't go below the required minimum cement contents. We have some flexibility. So a lot of people have been using fillers for many years, but I think we should be using fillers for all our concretes, not just high performance concretes, not concretes which are for pre-stressing pre work, for example, 80, 90 megapascals, we should use uh, fillers for many of our concretes in order to minimize, let it be driven by the, the cement. I should say a word as well about recycled uh, aggregates. Um, uh, the tradition um, has been is that when you demolish a building, you've got demolition, demolition waste and you might uh, crush that down and recycle it and use it for low grade materials. Whereas what we've been doing is, is getting into building before they're demolished, working with the demolition countries and taking cores and establishing which are the strongest part. So you might have a 30, 50 and 70 megapascal concrete and then to segregate those at source as you demolish and then send them for crushing so that you have a pile of high strength aggregate, which might be used in structural concrete, and then low, low grade uh, strength uh, aggr recycled aggregate for, for other applications. And uh, similarly for concrete that's not used, the waste that is brought back from site that's not used um, to develop the habit of making 30, 50 and 70 megapascal uh, formwork uh, and pouring the concrete in, coring it to make sure it's the right strength, and then having high grade material to use. Um, 
So on the recycle front, uh, there are difficulties with recycling aggregates, of course, um, the, apart from the fact that it is more porous because it has adhered cement paste on it, but it does reduce the strength as well, it tends to. Uh, although it reduces the strength, uh, if it's structural concrete, we hope that the concrete's not carbonated. In other words, it hasn't already absorbed carbon dioxide, and well, we might like it to, but uh, that's for reinforced concrete, we, we certainly don't want it to. But when you crush the aggregate up and you leave it out in the open, then that aggregate that actually absorbs a lot of, 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 uh, of carbon dioxide. So the carbon, uh, the, the adhered mortar actually is pre-carbonated and that will absorb some aggregate, which is obviously good news from a, a, um, a sequestration viewpoint. I think we can get over the high water content problem and the lower strength by uh, perhaps coating the aggregates. You can see that bottom left-hand corner by coating the aggregates with a, um, a silica fume uh, paste or slurry, uh, and that closes up the pores, and then we can proceed as normal. And there is the perception that you've got to recycle on site. Uh, you've got to reuse it on site. We cannot, of course, mix high quality concrete on site. We have to use ready mix. So we can find a way to electrify our trucks and our crushers uh, so that we can deliver the concrete from the, from the demolition site back to a ready mix plant and then deliver it back to our original site when we build something new. And um, then I think we can overcome the restrictions on travel distances in relation to carbon usage uh, in order to ensure that even recycled aggregate concretes is low carbon. And uh, there's a very good book just published very recently, I'll say more about that in a second, uh, uh, which is uh, over 650 pages, which is, um, which is uh, a warts and all look at the advantages and disadvantages of using recycled aggregates. And in, 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 in some countries in Europe, um, they're regularly used for, for structural uh, concrete, and we really need to get over the impediments that exist here for us to use recycled aggregates. I envisage that within uh, uh, hopefully a decade is that the vast majority of our concrete, demolished, de demolished concrete will be segregated, uh, uh, stockpiled and reused in new reinforced concrete. And I, I, I will show you, I hope at the end that that's possible. Um, just to, to say that uh, if you're interested in recycled concrete aggregates, um, um, I'm running a, a seminar uh, in April. There are only 40 places. Uh, and if you wish to attend that, it's a one day workshop on, on uh, the study of, of uh, many uh, well, over a thousand researchers uh, are contributing to that book, and it'll be delivered by uh, Professor Ravindra Deer. So if you're interested in that, uh, send me an email and there's a limited number of places. So let me give you a, an idea as to how we can develop recycled, uh, because there are these myths about it can't really be used in, 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 in terms of maintaining strength. So here's the typical mixed quantities that we saw before. Uh, and nothing unusual about that. But when we go to uh, replace the cementitious materials, and here you can see um, there is a higher quantity of cement there uh, um, in order to achieve high strength. So we're getting about 90 megapascals. So this is high strength concrete uh, using uh, um, about 60% about recycled low carbon materials. And we've also used a filler here. If you see uh, halfway down the page, we're using a calcium carbonate filler and a super plasticizer to give us the workability. So here here now uh, in the in mix C, um, again, we can get the same strength. Uh, we've managed to get a mix that does that. And we're replacing 100%. Now, you don't need to replace 100%, but we've replaced 100% of the aggregate with a recycled concrete where we selected it ourselves. This is 50. In its previous life, this was 50 megapascal concrete. As we replace that, put some steel fibers in. And as you can see, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, maintain a very high strength using 100% recycled concrete. Um, a lot has been said about uh, concrete sequestration, and we need to be very careful there um, because we have to design our reinforced concrete structures so that we don't sequestrate carbon dioxide. And the reason for that is that if carbon dioxide makes its way into concrete, the concrete uh, uh, is sufficiently permeable and has a, a fast diffusion rate. Within its lifespan uh, time, in the presence of oxygen and water, we are going to cause and will cause and do cause uh, uh, serious uh, corrosion of, of reinforced concrete. So we design it so that it only uh, uh, permeates within its life to maybe 20 or 30 mil uh, millimeters. 
So sequestration of carbon for reinforced concrete is very limited. However, as I say, when you uh, crush the concrete and leave it exposed for not very long, it, it, it absorbs a lot more. Mass concrete, of course, you can, you can, uh, you can encourage uh, uh, carbon dioxide sequestration if you so wish, uh, because there's no, there's no um, uh, reinforcing steel and uh, the, the uh, carbonation doesn't damage the concrete. But I just make a final point here uh, on this, just to say that um, the uh, uh, concrete blocks, when we pour them, and we've observed this, is that if you don't cure the concrete blocks, um, then you rely on an extra bit of cement in order to get them to harden and develop their strength. And it's not a very high strength that's required. Typically, nowadays, anything above seven and a half megapascals. Um, so I wonder whether or not, as some manufacturers clearly do, is whether the scope for using less cement, uh, but curing it much better so that you attain the necessary strength, and indeed even use recycled aggregates. Uh, uh, in a block, given that uh, it has a specific requirement for strength, but it should be possible to meet that requirement uh, uh, by optimizing the cement content. Just a thought. Um, in relation to moving on uh, to, to uh, uh, the, the constituents of concrete is we watch very closely the water cement ratio because that has a big influence on strength. It is a big influence on durability. But uh, when Mark Richardson and myself with the help of the ICF did a study of uh, almost all of the ready mix plants in the country, and we published that work and you can see in the graph on the right hand side, that for, let me pick an example, for a 40 megapascal concrete, there's a, a wide range of water cement ratios being used. And there are reasons for this. Uh, um, different uh, quality control in terms of the target which you have to aim for, um, different available aggregates, some of which are stronger or weaker, uh, and perhaps different cement uh, sources as well. So there are reasons for this variability. But when it comes to cement, which is what we're interested in reducing so that we can reduce the carbon footprint, we get, when we look at this, a similar graph for cement contents on the right hand, top right hand corner, you can see there's variability there. And if you look below, you can see that there's quite a lot of people making uh, 40 megapascal, 45 megapascal concrete with high quantities of cement. And one wonders whether or not we could use, for example, plasticizers, if they're not already using it, use plasticizers or, or uh, perhaps uh, better quality control or care, more careful quality control so that we achieve the target strength with a smaller quantity of cement. We, we shouldn't allow a free range, use as much cement as you like. And indeed, very often we put a limit on cement content for cracking purposes, thermal cracking purposes. So it's quite interesting the terminology that we use because we tend not to call them plasticizers anymore. Uh, the things uh, that allow us to reduce the water content because it gives us the workability that we need. And a lot of water is added simply for workability purposes. It's not there for strength purposes, it's there to make the concrete workable. And if you use a plasticizer that makes the concrete work more workable, you can, you can use less water. But if you're happy with your strength and you have some flexibility, you could also use less cement. So the use of a plasticizer means that we can use less cement. And that's very commonly practiced and we should recognize that many, many, most concretes use a plasticizer or a super plasticizer, but we don't do ourselves a service by calling it a, a mid to high range water reducer because if you're also reducing the cement content, why not call it a mid to high range cement reducer? Because it enables us to reduce the quantity of cement and still get the same strength and the same performance. So there's a thought. So this is an extract from the uh, a table um, uh, from the uh, um, EN 206, which is the European concrete specification, but this is an Irish table. And I wonder whether or not we give some thought. And I, I, I did this for this lecture specifically and put some numbers in red for this lecture. Um, but I wonder whether we should think about putting maximum cements in there as well. In other words, you shouldn't really be making, for example, uh, a 30 megapascal concrete with more than 350 kgs of cement. For carbon reasons, you shouldn't be able to do that because the minimum cement content is 280. And you know whether you argue whether that number should be 340, 350 or 360, I'm not interested in at the moment. What I'm interested in saying, well, actually, we should have maximum cement contents. And that should be driven by carbon, that you shouldn't be producing concrete, which is only 30 megapascals in strength, uh, if you have to use more than 350 uh, uh, kilograms of cement. That will encourage people to use the technology that we know exists uh, to, to get quality control and consistent materials 
uh, uh, so that we uh, can use smaller cement contents. Designers have a very large part to play. They have enormous technical requirements, of course, uh, EC2, for example, or EC3, and um, complicated technical requirements on lots of other things, creep, shrinkage, strength, um, uh, all of these things that they have, to, uh, they have to concern themselves with. But many consultants now are optimizing their structural arrangements. They're deciding on column spacing, the size of the members, the minimum strength required. Obviously, the bigger the span, the stronger the concrete needs to be for the same member size. So many consultants are doing multiple designs instead of one and using car, uh, carbon minimization software. And we should recognize that. And I think everybody should try to use it in order to actually pick the solution uh, that is, while still functional, uh, uh, is a solution that gives us a minimum carbon. Again, something that can be done. Uh, and then uh, last couple of slides, uh, uh, the precast concrete, uh, a lot is being done on modern methods of manufacture and there are very significant advantages. And here's a selection of real structures using all kinds of different facades. These are not all the same type of concrete. There's many, there's glass reinforced concrete, there's uh, geopolymers, there's a range of different concretes here. Um, some, uh, most of which are mentioned in my list of 50. Um, but when it comes to precast use and um, the use of uh, supplementary cementitious materials is not favored for productivity reasons, is if you need to strip your, 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 your formwork and cut your tendons at uh, 20, 20 hours or 22 hours, then the slow strength development of uh, most of the SCMs, such as slag and ash, is a disadvantage. So we have to find a way of uh, devising an admixture, which I know people are working on, an admixture which accelerates the strength of uh, um, these supplementary materials to encourage precasters to use it more. Uh, also, with the better quality control uh, in a factory environment, I think they can get away with lighter structures and smaller depths, and indeed promote the use of electric vehicles for the delivery uh, and direction of precast. So all of this will help in reducing the carbon. And then finally, I just want to, last case, um, is to say that uh, we've been involved over a number of years in making concrete, which is 100% recycled. So again, if you look at the typical quantities of, of stone, I've highlighted them there in red, Here's the recycled one, which we would have seen before. This is 100% recycled aggregate using 20 and 10 millimeters. Uh, and then this is the one we want to look at. And that is where we, we deliberately use silica fume to pre-treat the recycled aggregate so we don't have such a, a water loss problem or a workability problem. We've used recycled medium sand from a quarry. Uh, we've used a, a filler uh, as well. And we've used 100% non-Portland cement. And we've used a lithium, uh, not usually used, but we got home of some, hold of some recycled lithium. And it took us a year or two, but we demonstrated very clearly that lithium is an effective alkali activator, which meant that we didn't need to en use any other, uh, anything other than a recycled material to activate this, the cements. And we use solely rainwater. So we had a procedure for gathering, testing, and using filters uh, to use rainwater in concrete. And as you can see from the graph on the right, at 28 days, the green one, which is the what I would call sustainable concrete, uh, achieved the same strength as the parent material uh, after 28 days. So 100% recycled concrete has been demonstrated to be, to, to be usable. Whether it's practical uh, and can be rolled out on a large scale is a different question, particularly in respect of the availability of some of the materials. Uh, for example, in Ireland, uh, um, uh, recycled aggregates are not whole scale uh, available yet until there's uh, a demand for them, uh, a market for them, and technically uh, proven to be suitable. So um, I'd, I'd like to finish uh, by saying, I think I've looked at 10 different ways, uh, maybe 11 different ways of cutting down on either cement or indeed carbon use. Um, uh, and the one which is sitting out on its own there, the third bullet point from the bottom, is the one in which really would be, in my opinion, a game changer globally. All the others have significant contributions to make, and there are people who specialize in these areas. But the, that one there, which is the second last one, is the one that could be a game changer in, in allowing us uh, to use and continue to use uh, a, a material, Portland cement, which, for which there is no suitable large-scale global substitution at the moment, and yet demand is only going to grow. And I hope I gave you a couple of examples of how, with the appropriate research, uh, we can demonstrate that some of these new technologies are wholly feasible, uh, and we just really have to get on with it. Um, how many of these should be applied? All of them. We have 
got to do absolutely all of everything we can possibly do to bring carbon uh, down uh, throughout the world. So thank you for your attention. I hope I didn't run too much over time.